The Vice President of Liberia, Dr. Jewel Howard Taylor, has encouraged African businesses to invest in the continent's growing population. She was addressing members of the ANC's Progressive Business Forum in Johannesburg. The forum is a program tasked with strengthening relationships between government, the ANC and business. Howard Taylor warning that the African Renaissance will not be possible if Africans don't build Africa. The Vice President of Liberia has called on South African businesses to work together with her country in exploring new opportunities. She has encouraged the business community to prepare for a growing continent by developing the necessary infrastructure. If this is where the largest population will be in a few years, it makes sense for the factories to be on the continent. It makes sense for the road network to be built. It makes sense for us to do train networks, whatever it takes to carry people, information, technology, and materials around our continent. Instead of bringing it from China and some of the far places, if you have a factory here, the resources that you need to purchase them are already here. We must really begin to think about what we have and what we can get with the arrangements that we make. And the public and private sector uh, is the engine for growth and development across our continent. There are currently 25 South African companies operating in Liberia, and according to data by the Observatory of Economic Complexity, in the last 25 years, South Africa's export to Liberia have increased from 50 million in 1995 to 171 million in 2020. South Africa exports refined petroleum, stone processing machines, cars, delivery trucks and fruit juice to Liberia. Vice President Howard Taylor says the Africa Continental Free Trade Area now provides the opportunity for businesses to expand and for Africa to thrive. The African Renaissance, the African Industrial Revolution that we talk about will not be possible if Africans do not take the responsibility to build this Africa. Instead of looking across the seas to see what they want, they'll come up to our countries, they will take our resources, uh, refuse to process them there, carry to their countries, secure job opportunities for their people, secure economic prosperity for their people, secure peace and development whilst we remain in stages of underdevelopment except for a few countries. Diabo Sito, SAPC News, Johannesburg. The Vice President earlier delivered the keynote address at the University of South Africa's 2022 Founders Lecture under the theme, The Realization of the African Renaissance through the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. The Founders Lecture is in its 22nd year and focuses on critical issues in higher education, both on the continent and around the globe. Dr. Howard Taylor's voice is loudest on matters relating to gender equality, fighting for affordable and quality education, as well as a fair and transparent justice system, amongst others. She is one of Liberia's foremost advocates for increased opportunities for the women of her own country, as well as others on the African continent. She's also received many awards for her achievements. So it's a privilege to welcome the first female vice president of Liberia to full view. Good evening, Your Excellency. And I hope that you feel really welcome to in our studio and thank you for being with us tonight. This theme um, at that UNISA lecture, a really important one, uh, the realization of the African Renaissance through the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And you reanimated this concept of the African Renaissance. And what's interesting is that years and years after it was first mooted as a concept, you are saying that there is more possibility to, today than ever before that this is the moment and the opportunity of a lifetime for that to become real. Thank you, Iman, for having me here at SABC. Um, it's an honor you know, we have to now begin to consider what our future looks like as an African continent. Uh, we can't look at countries, uh, individual countries, because what we're talking about is a holistic approach across the continent development, um, industrialization, clean energy, um, opportunities for women and girls, opportunities for small businesses. And the idea of the African Renaissance became a louder voice many years ago from President, former President uh, Thabo Mbeki. Several meetings were held, and the points then were, we need to go beyond our first stage of, of freedom. We've gotten liberation, but we need to get involved in the economic activity of our countries. And whatever it takes, we must look at it as a new wave 
for the African continent. Um, a lot of things have gone through the, the different stages. Today we have a vehicle that I believe is a very good vehicle, the African Continent of Free Trade Agreement, which provides opportunities, removal of barriers, and the different things that would stop Africa from trading amongst itself. And I think this gives us a very good vehicle for increasing economic activity, reducing poverty, and providing opportunities for women across our continent. One of the points you make is that Africa is not a country. And even though we are sovereign states, uh, many states from, you know, fr fr from across the continent, we're often bundled together. Um, and you say that we are you know, labeled as an underdeveloped continent. What has been the effect of that perception and viewing us as just one homogenous series of countries? Well, the first thing it does, it labels our continent as ineffective, that we have no prospects, uh, that there are so many barriers that stop the continent as a whole from breaking loose and, and, and developing itself. That is not the truth at every level. There are countries like South Africa, Rwanda, Ghana. There are some countries that have gone, and we're not talking about uh, Northern Africa, we're talking about sub sahara Africa, because at the North is at a whole different level. Um, when they bundle us together like that, uh, whether you're doing good or not, everyone is seen in one basket. But what this does, because there's also a positive side, now that we're talking about Africa being the largest population, with still at least 40 to 50% of the world's resources here, if we look at it combined, it provides a maybe three billion uh, industry that we can take advantage of. So it's on the one side we're saying as underdeveloped, on the other side there are so many unlimited possibilities. It's something that boggles your mind. You just have to get involved to make sure this level is of benefit to everyone, especially women and girls. Dr. Howard Taylor, when I heard you speak on Friday and as I hear you speak again, um, you know, those statistics about this latent opportunity, uh, the resources, both human and natural, that the African continent has yet untapped, and these are opportunities for us to, to really use to our advantage. We still are in a situation where we are reliant on FDI. I think we had a record number of FDI last year. It was around 83 billion. Our biggest FDI injectors are coming from countries uh, like UK and, and, and Europe and so on. Why are Africans not buying this message and investing in other Africans. And I think this is the stage to do this. Um, foreign direct investment is important, but there must now be a partnership. If you come to Liberia, for example, that still has rubber, and you want to export rubber from Liberia, we must insist that there is a factory that produces tires or condoms or rubber bands. If you really want a partnership, which is what we're talking about, something must be left on our continent. And I think it takes a new kind of leadership to begin to see the benefits that it provides for our people. We can no longer accept um, contracts that just take things out of our country, especially our uh, mineral resources, and leave the countries bare. I mean, this is the age-old problem, right, of beneficiation. And, and you're saying, can we have that supply chain provision also factored into the raw material that we have in abundance on our continent. I hope it's a challenge we're going to be able to get right and overcome. But you're touching there now on the kind of leadership that we have um, on the continent. What you say is, you know, the right leadership is needed to popularize and really inspire collaboration and shared success. But the reality is that we have this problem, this endemic and historic problem, especially in coast, you know, post-colonial countries of leaders for life, legacy leaders. Uh, we have corruption. We have human migration, which is more out of, you know, being forced to leave, to go and find countries of opportunity. I think you touched on that in your speech as well. Um, how, how do we navigate that? And toxic leadership we do have in certain areas of our continent with this deferred dream that, that we constantly sit with. There's a whole new generation. 60% of the population on our continent are young people under the age of 40 years old. They now want better. They are the ones that are getting elected into offices. And you will find out that the old uh, style of leadership is actually fading, which is a part of the human progression. Nothing happens on the spur of the moment, but people see the new opportunities. You can imagine my country is 176 years old. I've been vice president for six years. It took us 170 years to elect a female vice president. So things are slowly changing. What we must begin to do now is to see 
what the new opportunities are. And it's already starting. When it comes to cocoa and chocolate, um, Ghana, Ivory Coast, yeah. and even Liberia, we do plant. We're now encouraging our farmers to go into diversified um, kinds of agriculture projects. We're deciding that the cocoa will be sent to one place and processed. So if someone wants to buy cocoa, then you have to go to that central point. And it's the same story of the West, how they developed. So we must just see the benefits and have our farmers and our young people now go and say, okay, I want to be involved in mining. Um, how do I make sure that we're able to bring the benefit of, of, of processing, whatever it is, diamond or coltan or whatever it is that the world needs. Some of it must be processed in our countries. What is happening is that you have, for example, let me tell you a story I heard a few months ago. Southern Africa sent Liberia some um, vaccines for COVID. And they were concerned this is, uh, about just a, month a few or two ago. Yes, yeah. about a month or so ago. And what they had decided was we were going to have the largest uh, population. How do we now start to produce important things like vaccines? And I was shocked to find out that to get a company who was producing vaccines from the West into South Africa, we had to get a waiver. And when I heard that, I was like, what? To just show you how things are a little bit difficult and they don't seem as easy, but the waiver was given. That company is now here in South Africa producing vaccines that can be easily sent throughout the rest of our continent. So it's, it's leadership. We want this. We have to have this done now. And I think if the leaders um, across our continent see the benefit, peace, security, empowerment, it makes sense to begin to look at business in that way. Young people are a really important demographic and, as you say, holds the key to a lot of productivity and benefit. We also will be the youngest continent in the world at some point in the future as well. If there's time, I'll circle back to young people. But let's look at women and some of the opportunities you believe are embedded in the African Continental Free Trade Agreement for them to, to really thrive. And we know, of course, when you make a, an investment in, in women, uh, your, return of in, your return on that investment exponentially higher than, than, than male-run business. And that's why it's important to bring women on board. And this has been a conversation for decades. How do you keep half of the population on a continent under, underserved? How do you not utilize the energies, the vision, the tenacity, the commitment? Now, when, when a woman makes a commitment to do something, she goes from zero to 100. She won't rest until it is done. That's why you will find out factories and, and other industries will hire women more because they are committed. They tie that commitment into their children, their, 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 their children to feed, their young people to send to school. So th their minds are, how do I stay stable enough? And I think some of what uh, women are doing in agriculture, we make up the largest number um, across the agriculture sector, for example. Um, how can we now provide processing ends for these farmers? How can we provide new equipment so they don't have to use the old ways that takes all day, it's back-breaking work um, that they have to do? How can we make their work easier? And I think those are the instruments that we must bring to bear so that whatever sector you want to be in, whether it's producing uh, fragrance for, for, for perfume or whether you're, you're, you're making tomato paste for, for what we used to cook, or whatever it is you're doing, how do we process? It. And the processing end will help because the women are at one sector and young women and men can help to process. So you then take on a whole new flavor. And I think people will be happier because there, was, there will always be a little bit more when you actually pr process what you have as opposed to just sending raw tomatoes or raw I mean, pineapples out of the country. So there's an exponential opportunity that will bring the ripple effect down to where it needs to be. I mean, we're two years into the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, roughly. We're constantly talking about how women can reach in. How does the, the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and those partners and, and people charged to making it alive and functional reach out to women? Well, what we've started to do, and I'm championing this whole aspect of the Continental Free Trade Agreement being a vehicle that everyone can use because I see the benefits of it. We have to keep talking about it. We have to keep highlighting it. There are about 38 nations that have ratified it, so we still haven't reached the entire continent. That has to be done. New laws have to come into place to provide a more open space so that people are able to trade uh, within our continent easier. Uh, the road networks need to be completed. There, I think when you come to Southern Africa, 
Uh, the road networks are beautiful, they are accessible. Uh, when you come to some parts of the western part of Africa, there are still uh, gaps in between. So countries now have to work on fulfilling those gaps and make sure, for example, ICT, you go to my country, there are a lot of places you will reach and you can't even get a signal on a telephone. So some of these things have to be put in place, but while we're working on finalizing those, the process can begin. I want to, you know, take a slightly more personal uh, tone in our conversation now. You've made quite a few firsts in your, in your leadership journey, you specifically. I think you were one of the first protagonists of the creation of a women's ministry uh, in your country. And also, you became the first woman to be given the title of chief, conferred by some of the traditional chiefs and elders. You are a venerable, venerable chief of the National Traditional Council. What particular significance does this hold for you? I grew up in a country where the chiefs and the elders are considered, even here in South Africa, they are considered the owners of the land. It, what it means is that they determine uh, the outcomes of what happens in the, in the villages. They're the leaders. They are the voices. The war actually destroyed this entire group. Um, they became poor because we've taken such a long time out of the civil crisis and then just trying to get things back on track. Now they were somehow marginalized. Um, now the young people had a voice. You would go into a village or a community and you hear the young people speak, but the elders who were more experienced, who had much more to give in terms of helping us to rebuild and put back our systems, were out of the system. And after having some conversations and going across the country, I realized that we needed a vehicle to bring them up to the level where they were. The advisors, uh, the seers, the visionaries, uh, the one who would tell you, we've gone this route before, it hasn't worked. Uh, why don't we take another route? Because they were the advisors of, of whatever was going on, crisis, um, domestic violence, whatever was happening, the elders sat as, as um, the, the council in those communities. And they had lost this, this exact position because of the war. So I thought it was so important, and I'm happy that Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was president then, saw it fit to say, yes, you're right, let's bring them back to where they now will be consulted on issues and be our voice. And so I worked in the legislature along with Madam Sirleaf, who was president, to ensure that this law was passed in both houses. And when she signed it into law, um, I was invited to sit with her because it gave them a whole different aspect of what they should be doing. And they were not just old men, you know, that have been thrown to the side because they have a value of, of wealth and knowledge that a young person doesn't have. It said in some of our parables, I don't care how tall you are, you can never see as far as your father has seen. And so that sight, that vision we needed, and it's giving them a new, a new wave and they're now involved in whatever issues we find ourselves in. They're the peacemakers, uh, they are the mediators, and it has brought a lot to help us as a post-country nation um, continue to sustain our peace. Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Jewel Howard Taylor, thank you very much for talking to us this evening. Really appreciate your time and you stopping by. Thank, thank you. It's you. an honor and a privilege. I'm really happy. Thank you. Go well.